Hello everybody, welcome to the Amerigo building. My name is Becky, I've been with the group for almost four years, so I'm going on four years. Um, it's really, really fun. This is called the Amerigo building. It was built in 1910. It was originally built by the Idaho Wholesale Company. In 1936, it actually became the Idaho Safeway Company, and then since they went out, Amerigo has then owned it. So it has been Amerigo for quite some time, and I'm gonna let Marlene introduce herself and tell you a couple little stories, so. Um, I'm Marlene, um, I've worked for Amerigo for 10 years, and it's been about 10 years ago, but I keep in contact with them a lot. They're kind of like family, so I've been around. Um, oh. My situation <laughs> actually happened upstairs on the main floor, and after it happened, um, I went and told Grandma Claudia. Now, Grandma Claudia is the mother of the owner now, and therefore we call her Grandma Claudia. She was the receptionist at the time. When she told me um, all the different entities on each level of this building and kind of what to look out, watch out for, she told me down here was the grumpy old man. And she says, you know it's the grumpy old man because you'll feel the cold. It gets really, really cold. So um, she said, and if you feel the cold, just run. Okay, got it. Well, I was down here with my partner one evening, and he was actually putting those signposts away right there. And that was actually, at the time, mounted up higher, and the rebar brackets were taller. So to get those signposts in, you actually had to really kind of throw them up, down, and in the brackets. Well, as he was doing that, I was down in the back corner putting away the jute mat. And during, at that time, too, this hallway was blocked off. There was a lot of stuff in front of it. So to get to the jute mat, you came off of the old elevator, which sometimes stops when it gets down here and it won't let you back up. Oh man. So that's why we're not using it tonight. Anyways, and then you would have to make your way to the back corner. Now in that back corner is where he likes to be. And as I was putting the jute mat away, it got cold. Oh. But I didn't really think too much of it. I kept putting more jute mat away. And then when I saw my breath, my mind said, run. <laughs> So I started hurrying towards the elevator when I heard my partner hear some sort of commotion and him yell, ow! Uh. So I came back and what he said is as he was putting the bases, because the bases at the time were right underneath the sign post. So he was adjusting those bases underneath and somehow one of the sign posts came out of the bracket and hit him on the back of the head. Oh. So, that's what he had here. I do want to point out that this is the original foundation of the building. We have the original rock walls and also some of the original signs you can see up there. Um, some of the things. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to go into a little bit of what we found on the investigation when we did the America where Amerigo warehouse. Um, like she said, there is a grumpy old man down here and he is in fact grumpy. Um, on our investigation that night, we had our K2 meter down here and we were asking some questions and we did get some hits, so answers to our questions. Um, if you can see, the windows are quite high off the ground and that night we had a shadow that completely blocked out all of the lights um, from the window. Now, it was nighttime, but you can definitely tell a distinct person walking by that window because it is light outside. Um, so he is, he is said to be down here. We don't know if he's just extremely tall or what, but he blocked out those lights. Um, back in this back corner over here, there is a very old furnace. It is rumored to say that they played poker and smoked cigars back in that corner. And the, the night of the investigation, we heard voices and we smelled the cigar smoke. So we don't know if the grumpy old guy was really bad at poker and is trapped down here because he lost so much. It's, we don't know, but could be a fact. Um, also, Marlene and Lisa and another lady were down here investigating and Marlene was standing in the <coughs> middle of them. And to her right, she was fine, comfortable temperature. To her left, she was freezing. Lisa was shivering and very, very cold and could see her breath, as well as a bunch of us throughout the night could. 
So Marlene here had a temperature gauge and when she would put it to her right, it would be a nice maybe 60, 69 degrees. It was still in March, but this building is a little warmer than outside. And then when she switched it over to her left, it would drop 15 degrees as we watched it. Um, so he probably was in the corner with them, we don't know. Um, but like I said, we, we did get a lot of K2 hits and we did get very cold. And um, we got a ball of light back in the corner where he likes to um, quote unquote chill. There was a light that appeared and it just stayed there. Now when you have a flashlight and you turn it on, you can see the beaming lights in the dark. This was just a light that just sat there and when we went to go see what it was, it went away. So that was a little bit what we caught down here on our investigation. Also, um, the very, very back light. We have tried to put in a light there several, several times um, and every time we would put it in, it would be burnt out the next day. We'd print it in another one, it would be burnt out the next day. So we would give it three, five months, and then we'd try again. So we have just had that very back light in there now for about a year and a half. He's allowed us to have the lights. Um, it's getting really dark here because our other lights are starting to burn out as we do these tours. We don't really know why. Um, what else was there? There was something else I don't remember. No. As I remember, we'll tell you. Yeah. <laughs> let, oh, when other um, construction workers do come down here by themselves during the day, at night, whatever, they always feel or hear footsteps behind them. And when the elevator does not work, we do use the stairway. We hardly ever use the stairway to come down here at first. And so one thing he really likes to do is chase people up the stairs. You start going up the stairs and you hear someone come right after you going up the stairs. He really likes to do that. Almost everybody who's been down here by themselves and has had to use those stairs has been chased up the stairs. But we'll go back down into the corner now. Yes, and be very aware this building is very active so you may have something happen. So. Oh, This is the room that he likes to be in. If you guys want to step in there, take pictures, look around, that's where he usually is. Other tours have taken pictures and have gotten interesting things in that room. They actually caught the floating wall of light, so. <laughs> Well, welcome to the main floor of the Marigold Building. Marlene has experiences that she's going to talk to you about, so here you go. So, as I was telling everyone, that where my experience happened, that receptionist desk was actually turned straight. Um, and my job here at Amerigo, I was a traffic control supervisor. So in the day, I would do that, but then at night, I would come and do paperwork. Certified payroll, plans, things like that. So I would come in around 10 o'clock at night and I would go through the night. Um, whether that meant one o'clock, four o'clock in the morning was when I was done. I did it all till I was done. So I was working at my computer in the office right around the corner and there was an adding machine on that receptionist desk. And the adding machine turned on and there was numbers and it was putting paper out. Like it was adding <laughs> stuff. and. Sometimes we jimmy rig things around here to make them work. So I went over to it, looked at it, it was on. So I turned it off and it turned off. So I went back to my computer and started working again. Five minutes later, it came on again. So I went back out, turned it on, turned it off and it stopped. <laughs> went back to my computer, five minutes later, it came on again. <laughs> my thought was, if I have to keep turning this thing off all night, I'm not gonna get anything done. So I went out, turned it on, turned it off, turned it off. I grabbed it, flipped it over, pulled the battery lid off, and there was no batteries. So I put that down and I followed the cord and it wasn't plugged in. And that's when the back, my hair on the back of my neck stood up. My heart started pounding and I took a couple deep breaths. I placed it back down on the receptionist desk and I said, all right, you better stop, and you better <laughs> stop now. If you don't, I'm leaving. And then I went back to my computer, continued doing more of my work, and nothing happened. So the next day I came and I told Grandma Claudia my experience. 
Grandma Claudia just laughed. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's when she began to tell me about the man downstairs. And she says up here on the main floor is a little boy. He's a prankster. And then upstairs is a possessive woman. And she knew their names. And Grandma Claudia is no longer with us to be able to ask that information again. But um, another night when we were, well not night, another day at work day, one of our employees was in the bathroom and she came flying out of there. Her pants were still around her and she <laughs> ran out into the parking lot. So we went after her to find out what was wrong, what had happened. And after she calmed down a lot, um, she said, you know how the toilet paper sometimes unrolls itself and it will fall onto the floor and start curling. And we're like, yeah. She says, well, it started doing that. She said, so I watched it and it went down and it made two curls. She says, and then from the top, it started spitting out towards her, right at her. <laughs> so she took off. <laughs> um, we have locks on the door knobs of the bathrooms, but inevitably every time you sat down to do your business, one of the doors would open on you. So we put in more locks so that we can actually keep the doors locked. Um, on the night when they came back to tell me about what they had found on the investigations on the two buildings, we were sitting at that table and if you work here to Marigold long enough, um, you get used to the noises that are around. We have the friendship club next door. And so you do hear bathrooms flushing, things like that. Well, as we were here, it kept sounding like a door was shutting right where I am. And I said out loud, that's too close. But then I heard the toilet flush and I'm like, okay, it's the friendship club. And then we kept going a little longer and it sounded like a door slammed right where the TV was. And I said, that is too close. And then we heard footsteps walk across the ceiling. And I said, nobody's supposed to be here. And John, who's always prepared, had his K2 and he's like, can I walk around here? And I said, sure. So he starts walking around, he goes into the bathroom and he comes back out and he's like, yeah, yeah, it was just the friendship club, they closed the door on me. And I said, what door? He's like, the second bathroom door. And I said, because the friendship club has no access to Amerigo at all. And he said the door was open about this much and when he reached for the handle, it closed. And I said, well, we can go check and make sure nobody's there, but nobody should be here. I'll continue the story on the next floor. We have had, I was sitting when I picked up keys for the tour, I was sitting in your seat and my boss was sitting there and I was talking to my boss and as I was talking to her, something hit the back of my chair. And I looked at her and she's like, I heard it. And she, then she started telling me how, cause she comes usually on Saturdays with a group of women to exercise. They were doing their exercise routine and she says that she was walking backwards doing the, the step. She's like, and I don't know if I stepped on anybody's toes or what, but she got shoved forward when she was the very last in line. So he's very much active and playful. And as she was saying about the little boy who likes to play pranks, he is indeed active and still here. Uh, a couple nights on the tours, we have had the chimes up there on that uh, little shelf start moving and jingling. We have heard him laugh in this corner over here and he has just been around playing little pranks on everybody and anybody that he can. On the night of the investigation, we would sit in this room with one of the girls who did not like to go downstairs in either of the basement, or the basement in the building that we just came from or the basement in this building. So we would sit on the floor with her and we would take turns and um, one of the groups that was up here doing an investigation, John and Hannah, they were talking about the little boy who likes to play pranks. And as they were talking about it, John got poked in the belly by the little boy. Um, and a couple seconds later, the, the bathroom door came open and nobody, thank heavens, was on the other side doing anything, but the door did come open. Um, as, as they started talking again about the little boy, the printer right behind you in that corner did turn on. Now to turn it on, you have to open up a little lid and flip a switch. And it takes about five minutes to warm up before it will print anything or do anything for you. That particular night, it turned on, beeped twice, and printed out a blank piece of paper. So we asked Marlene to see if she could reenact it and And I she, tried pushing all the buttons, everything that I knew to try to get it to do the same thing. And it just told me, warming, warming. So I'm like, I can't do it, sorry. And I turned it off. <laughs> so they continued to talk about the instance that just happened and a couple minutes later it flipped back on. 
So we don't know. He likes to play around and that is something that is his toy and we turned it off and I don't know if it's on but we, we tried doing that to see if he'd come out and play for you. Um, before we move on to the next floor, I'm going to talk about the system that's behind me. This is called our DVR, our digital video recording system. What it does is it's basically four extra pairs of eyes. We will set these up in hot spots, if you will, if they're spots that a lot of activity is set to happen. And they will record things that if we are not in the room at the time and something happens, we will catch it on the camera. Sometimes we will have people watching the cameras and if they see something out of the ordinary that happens, they will send a group to that room to check it out. Um, it is a very nice piece of equipment to have. We have caught some very interesting footage on this. We have caught shadows, we have caught an equipment moving on its own, and we have also caught balls of light following our investigators down hallways and through um, very weird places that you wouldn't think things are. So that's a little bit of our system. It's a very, very handy system to have. And we're going to take you up to our upstairs now and we'll introduce go. you to the next ghost. Yeah, we're going to go right through the bathroom door that just started closing on us. <laughs> All right, they're moving some stuff in right now, but I'll tell you what happened. We'll continue the story. So as we got through the bathroom, you can see we looked up here and everything was dark. So we decided to come upstairs to see if anybody was here. Nobody was here. On the night of the investigation, me and Lisa were actually drawn to the second window over there. And we sat on the couch. While we were sitting on the couch, the third pillar down, we saw a shadow go by it three times. When we got up here that night, both of us had the same idea of showing John where we had seen the shadow. So as we started walking down, John said, is there anybody here? And he got a spike on his K2. And he said, if you're here, I want you to touch this just like this. And he touched it three times. After he did that, he got three spikes. And we continued down a little bit more. And if you can see in the back here, there's yellow barrels. And about from here to that gray garbage can is about how close we were to these yellow barrels. And those yellow, yellow barrels normally hold gravel. But what we heard was very loud and it sounded like someone had tore the top off of a gravel bag and it was spilling all over the floor. And we, we couldn't see anything and then it sounded like someone grabbed the gravel and threw it up in the air and it was raining gravel down. But we still couldn't see anything. So we were kind of lingering there and, and John was talking and saying, well, thank you for showing. And as he was saying that, the K2 went straight into the red and it stayed in the red. And so he started moving it back and forth. And as he moved it to the side, it would drop. But then when he came back a little, it was in the red. And so he moved it to this side and he did the same. So it was actually a little mass, kind of like, and it was about this tall in the air and then it began to move and it first moved over to Lisa and like sat right on top of Lisa and she said oh look it likes me <laughs> and I thought to myself oh please don't like me and then it started moving and it went over to John and it got pretty close to John and then it started coming my direction when it got about here in my head I said don't come any closer and it stopped and then it went into the middle because we were in a triangular position and it went into the middle of us and then it returned over to John and then it went and sat on Lisa again. And as it was sitting on Lisa, he had his K2 and it just disappeared. It, the K2 dropped and it went away. So as we were leaving and he was saying thank you very much for for you showing us that you are here. Have a good night, goodbye. We got one more spike, and all of us felt the distinct impression that she had said goodbye. Um, Grandma Claudia said that she's very possessive because she told me that her stuff was in that back corner. As you see, a lot of the family members store their stuff up here. And, she, and Grandma Claudia also did. 
and she stored hers in the back. Well, when she had her new home and she began to move her things out, one of her lamps flew past her head and hit the wall. So if something is up here for very long, she feels like it is hers and she does not want it moved. She does not want it messed with and you better not take it. Or she, she lets you know she's around. She also has a very distinct smell of lavender. Many of the employees have smelt the lavender. People have seen her standing by the stairwell and she calls to the little boy downstairs. When you're downstairs, you can hear her actually calling for him to come. And we have heard her through the elevator shaft and we've heard her through the stairwell. Um, just a little bit of what we found also up here on our investigation. As she mentioned, we they uh, saw shadows and they just had weird K2 meter hits and everything. The couch over there is said to be hers and she does not like it when you sit on it. Um, throughout the tours, we have heard her speak. We actually had a whole tour hear her say the word quiet. Um, so we don't know. She is up here. We don't know why. It is rumored that she is the mother to the son on the main floor and for some reason she cannot get to him. So, and she made me that known to us that she cannot get to him because she they have a tendency of playing with your emotions if you let them and we had an experience where we were up here and we were kind of provoking asking her why she could not get to her son and <coughs> things would have it and our investigator started crying so um, after going from happy to sad in just a matter of seconds so we don't know why but for some reason she's trapped on this floor and he is trapped on that floor so it's very interesting but that's a little bit about what happened here so. Um, many of the mothers sometimes bring their children to work with them and there have been instances where these children have actually spoke to all of the entities in the floors. Um, the one child he that spoke to her got really really scared and calls her the choking woman because when she spoke to him she had her hands around her neck. The older brother however said well, she does that because she has lung problems and she can't speak very well. So he's also spoken to her. The little boy downstairs, they've spoken to him. And one of the aunts told the little boy, if the next time you see the prankster, tell him to go to the light. That his family is waiting for him in the light. And so then he came later and said, I saw him. And she's like, did you tell him? And she said, he said, yes. She said, what did he say? And he and the little boy, the prankster said, the lights were on for a while, but someone turned the lights off, so I can't go there anymore. Um, downstairs in the basement, another little boy was sitting there saying, you better not do that. That's naughty. I'm going to tell my aunt Dottie, you're being naughty. And she was like, who are you talking to, buddy? He's like, my friend, but he's thinking about doing some naughty things. <laughs> And so they have all interacted. We did have kittens um, on the main floor and the kittens would actually sleep on the couch and they would all wake up together, look at something and follow it. They also would be walking, look up and swerve around something that we couldn't see. So the kittens and the children have all interacted with whatever's in the building. But as they're moving stuff, you can look around. If you have any questions, we'll answer those. Mm -hmm.